erratic tweets. This week, Politico revealed that Yale psychiatry professor Bandy Lee recently briefed a group of worried Congress leaders about the president's behavior. Her warning to lawmakers, quote, Trump is going to get worse. Joining us now, Dr. Howard Dean, former governor of Vermont, former Democratic National Committee chairman and MSNBC contributor. Chris Whipple is the author of The Gatekeepers, How the White House Chiefs of Staff Define Every Presidency. And Dr. James Hamblin, he's a senior editor uh, at The Atlantic, the author of a new piece here, Is Something Neurologically Wrong with Donald Trump? Let's start with the piece. Uh, why you decided to write it, what led you to write it, and what conclusions you came to? You know, these are questions about the president's fitness that have been on a lot of people's minds from the time before the election until now. And you have a wide spectrum of opinions about how the medical community should respond to that. Should people say anything at all? Or are physicians, experts obligated to weigh in when they, when they recognize what they believe to be pathology? So I just wanted to break through that and try to find <laughs> what's a systematic, as objective possible way to go about talking about this. Well, let me pin down the spectrum of things that you've observed here or others have observed here. It ranges from some discursive way that he speaks to uh, what we saw in terms of how he picks up water or slurring a speech during, a, during a, an address that he gave. Um, give us a sense of the range there, the size of that spectrum. Right. So you have some people who are saying he is clearly uh, unable to uh, ex execute the basic functions that would be needed to do something like uh, launch a nuclear weapon. I mean, the cognitive reasoning skills are not there. To there are possibly some issues with coordination or language that su suggest early cognitive decline and should be further evaluated, but we can't say anything. Uh, so you have a, a, a full spectrum of, of ideas about what's going on, if anything. And, and the, the basic point is that the only systems we have in place to deal with a presidential disability or illness are, are voluntary. If the president decides to undergo testing and then voluntarily decides to disclose uh, the results. Hey, last question on that point. I think there'll be a lot of people watching who will say, oh, this is overly speculative. What do you know you're observing from afar? And I think that something important that you bring up in the piece is that is perilous. To have to come to these conclusions from afar is something that needs to be corrected. Right. I, <laughs> I haven't spoken to any physician who feels comfortable or really wants to be making these judgment calls or observations. Ideally, there is a one-on-one face-to-face -on -one -face interaction with as much data as possible informing an objective objective clinical assessment, and that seems to be what everyone would ideally like. Uh, Governor Dean, Dr. Dean, Jim Hamlin writing in that piece that he's not uh, alone. What are you uh, observing here? Again, you're observing from afar. You're not, uh, you're not the clinician here responsible for the care of, of <clears throat> President Trump. What are you seeing? How do you process what you're hearing, uh, yes, in this book, in interviews, and from the president himself? Well, I think, you, I think um, you're, James is right. You can't uh, talk, you can't make a diagnosis, but you can say a number of things. First of all, judgment is clearly impaired. In order to make that judgment, you simply have to know a lot about how leadership works, how the office works, how, uh, how CEOs make decisions. Uh, I do know something about that. This guy is not capable of uh, acting and rationalizing uh, on, uh, on pieces of information that he's been given in a sensible way. Uh, secondly, he clearly has some sort of a personality disorder. He says things every day that are not true. Uh, and that's been documented by numbers of people, uh, both in the, in the reporting uh, world and elsewhere. He just says things that just are ap the opposite of the truth, not the truth at all. So there's clearly a disorder. Now the question is, what is the disorder? And we, I, you know, it's I, I think that he sometimes is not really living in the real world. That would be a, a, a form of psychosis. Now, that's very serious. But it's not clear that he's, he lies because he thinks somehow that redeems him or because he really doesn't know the truth between the, a lie and the <clears throat> truth, which is psychosis. Governor Dean, how much or is your thinking... Of mild psychosis. How much is your thinking on this evolved? I recall a few months back you weighed in on this uh, somewhat controversially about what you thought you observed there from the, the president of the United States uh, during the primaries uh, leading up to the, the presidential election. How much is your thinking on this evolved? Well, uh, you know, I'm taking it a lot more seriously. I mean, in, in the... You know, that was a sort of a, that, that the, you know, either the tweet about him making, using cocaine. That's the one. I, I, did, I did that, but not because I really thought he used cocaine, but because that is the kind of thing at the time the press was letting him get away with all the time. Uh, when he would say these things, they would go after it, and they would, instead of trying to say anything about it, they would 
ask everybody if they'd been using cocaine. And so, you know, that was really more aimed at the press than it was at Trump. And I don't believe that Trump has a drug problem and from testimony of the people who know him. But I do believe that he has a fairly serious psychiatric problem, and I'm not sure what it is. And I don't think you can... It isn't until you actually examine them. Chris Whipple, I want to bring you into the conversation here. You looked at presidential history, looked at the roles of, of chiefs of staff in your most recent book, and something that Jim brings up in his piece is the way uh, thinking about the role of the president has changed. And you look at Ronald Reagan, who uh, acknowledged in 1994 that he was battling Alzheimer's while he was president of the United States. Yeah. There was no mechanism mm -hmm. for that. Something else that you bring up, Jim, as well, is that presidents are getting older. Uh, and you look at older populations and what they have to wrestle with. There are things you have to take into consideration that you haven't uh, before. How much has the, the role of the president changed, and how does that come the, the way that we look at these issues? Well, I think that Donald Trump is absolutely unprecedented. I mean, hats off to Michael Wolff for showing in devastating detail that we really are living through a real life version of the producers, only that it's the producers now with nuclear weapons. And, you know, I've been doing some of my own reporting on the Trump White House for, for the new chapter of my paperback, uh, The Gatekeepers, and talked to a number of people very close to Trump who, who say, this is somebody with no capacity for empathy. This is someone with no capacity for pity, and therefore someone who possibly cannot understand the consequences of his own actions. That's a pretty frightening thing. You know, when Richard Nixon was walking the halls of the West Wing at the height of Watergate, talking to the oil portraits, and drinking heavily, Al Haig, who was his chief of staff, and Defense Secretary James Schlesinger made sure that the nuclear codes were safe. I think that this is in a way more frightening because mm. Richard Nixon was more stable mentally than Donald Trump, in my opinion, and he had a minimal respect for constitutional norms. I think that Trump has no respect for any norms. I think he's a human wrecking ball. And, and that's a frightening prospect. Chris Whipple, I'll ask you lastly just about the role of the chief of staff as a stopgap here, something that Jim brings up as well, as you don't really have a mechanism in place to call someone out or express concern about things like that. You listen to John Kelly, chief of staff, uh, and he said in so many words, it's not his job to keep the president <clears throat> in check, it's his job to keep the staff in check. Where is that? That's Where a, is that? Mechanism? That's a fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of the job. Every successful chief, the two best in, in history, James Baker and Leon Panetta, will tell you that the easy part is making the trains run on time in the West Wing. The hard part, and by far the most important part, is walking into the Oval Office, closing the door, and telling Donald Trump what he doesn't want to hear. Now, when Ronald Reagan was in the throes of Iran-Contra, uh, and, and possibly with diminished mental capacity. His chief of staff, Howard Baker, and, and Baker's deputy, Ken Duberstein, sat Reagan down. Mm. And Reagan did not want to admit that he had traded arms for hostages, but Baker and Duberstein persuaded him that he had to apologize, that he had to make a speech in which he did just that, and he recovered politically, and the rest is history. He went on to finish a transformative two-term presidency. Mm. That's what White House Chiefs of Staff have to be able to do. Chris Whipple, thank you very much. Uh, Jim Hamlin, Governor Dean, thanks to you uh, as well. Appreciate it. Thank Still you. ahead, the oddities of the Oval Office, from cheeseburgers in bed to his love of McDonald's. A close friend of President Trump weighs in about the Stranger Things detailed in.